very good morning to your colleagues. Happy that you're able to join us today. I am Dr. Shanti Singh Anthony, the coordinator for HIV knowledge management at the Pan-Caribbean Partnership Against HIV and AIDS PANCAP based in Georgetown, Guyana, at the CARICOM Secretariat. I am your moderator for today's webinar on the interpretation and management of HIV resistance. This is a PANCAP webinar in collaboration with the Pan American Health Organization, and I wish to thank PAHO for the continuing and ongoing collaboration in medical education and capacity building for healthcare practitioners in the region. The objectives of today's webinar are to identify indications for ordering viral genotypes, phenotypes, and archive proviral DNA resistance tests to interpret general outcomes of HIV-1 resistance testing based on associated viral mechanisms, to examine antiretrovirals commonly used in constructing complete regimen against resistant HIV virus, to recognize recently approved ARVs against XDR HIV-1 virus, and finally to list resources for clinician management of HIV-1 resistance. Before we get into the webinar, a few housekeeping notes. Your mics are muted. If you have any questions, please type and submit these using the chat bar that's on your webinar panel. Uh, we will take your questions during the Q&A segment, which will take place after the presentation. We're recording the webinar, and the, rec the recording will be shared on PANCAP social media platforms for the benefit of those persons who could not have attended this live session with us this morning. But by continuing to be in the webinar, you're consenting to be recorded. At the end of the session, you will receive a certificate of participation, but you will also receive a post-webinar evaluation. I am kindly asking that you complete these um, and as, as your feedback is really important as we continually strive to improve your webinar experience. At this time, I will go ahead and introduce our speaker for this morning's webinar. Dr. David Coren is an infectious disease clinical pharmacist for Temple University Health Systems in, in Pennsylvania. He's an adjunct assistant clinical professor for both the School of Pharmacy and the Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University and a faculty for the Mid-Atlantic AIDS Education and Training Centers. Dr. Coren received both his Doctor of Pharmacy and his Master's in Public Health from Temple University and completed postgraduate pharmacy practice and infectious disease residencies at Yale New Haven Hospital and Cleveland Clinic. Dr. Coren is a board certified pharmacotherapy specialist and a credentialed HIV pharmacist from the American Academy for a of HIV Medicine. His clinical interests includes, include innovative models for pharmacy delivery of care, as well as the prevention, treatment, and management of HIV and hepatitis C. Dr. Coren has presented viral infection related research abstracts at the regional, national, and international levels, and has published numer numerous man manuscripts in peer-reviewed journals. He serves on the National Committee for both the American Academy of HIV Medicine and the HIV Medicine Association, and was named a fellow of the Infectious Disease Society of America. It gives me great pleasure in asking Dr. David Coren to present to us this morning. Over to you, Dr. Coren. Good morning, everyone. Wherever you are joining from, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is David Coren. I have to live up to that introduction now. Uh, so I am, as Shanti mentioned, a uh, infectious disease clinical pharmacist uh, at Temple University Healthcare System here in beautiful Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the birthplace of the United States. It's kind of a gloomy day a little bit here today. But, you know, we're here today to talk about HIV resistance. And uh, first, before we begin, a big, big thank you to all of the staff at PANCAP, at PAHO, you know, for making these webinars available. You know, these, these training programs are so important 
because there really just isn't a good textbook if we're looking at HIV medicine as a whole. There, there are little bits and pieces we can kind of piece together. The American Academy of HIV Medicine makes a pretty decent uh, compendium, but there really isn't good literature, good training material, with the exception of us learning from one another. And so I do invite questions from each of you, you know, wherever you are listening in from, because that's what we're here to do. We're here to learn from one another, despite you know very slightly different circumstances that we have in, in relation to each of our own individual practices. So today's lecture is gonna be titled, The Update on the Interpretation and Management of HIV Resistance, regional training for HIV clinicians. Here's all of my information. If you do have any questions beyond today's lecture, I do invite you to feel free to reach out to either PENCAP or email me directly. And so we did already, oh, there we go. I do have a couple of disclosures, as you can see here on the slide, and the objectives we've already kind of talked about. So we're gonna be looking at different kinds of resistance testing, just a quick overview of the objectives. We're going to look at what those then mean and how to, in a very broad sense of the term, interpret some resistance tests. We're going to look at medications that we can use, understanding that not every medication is available in all locations. We're going to recognize some recently approved antiretrovirals against XDR HIV virus. Again, also recognizing that not every medication is available in all locations, but to just at least know what exists out there. And finally, list resources for clinical management of HIV-1 resistance. So I've labeled a lot of the sections in this talk very simply. So resistance testing, which, when, how do we do this? And you'll notice in a lot of my uh, slides from today's lecture that I am referencing some of the American guidelines. And I'm not necessarily saying that you shouldn't follow local guidelines with whatever your uh, location prefers or is standard of practice, but rather this is just a way that we do it and here in the United States. And this can be also apply toward World Health Organization guidelines or other guidelines that you may be following locally. So nothing, nothing, before we even talk about resistance, nothing can replace a good question and answer session with your patient. Because as we're taking a look at problems with medication adherence, developing to resistance, we have to take a look at the adherence, we have to take a look at adherence, because what we know is that antiretrovirals work. They work, provided that the patient takes them. So if the patient is not taking them, this may not necessarily jump to resistance. It may mean that there's some sort of adherence barrier per se. So we have to ask, you know, what are some barriers to procurement? You know, I, I had the issue this morning in clinic where I had a patient with an insurance issue that they transitioned from one insurance to the next. You may have an issue where a patient has transportation difficulty to and from a local pharmacy. And so maybe the pharmacy can offer some delivery services or something as simple as that. So we have to make sure that we are looking at what I like to call the social determinants of healthcare. You know, looking at not only the medical issues of the patient in front of you, but everything surrounding that patient that has brought them there to that moment in time. So once we've gotten past the adherence assessment, once we've understood that the patient is taking the medication regularly, we then can take a look at pharmacokinetic treatment issues. Now, I'm going to have you all think as pharmacists for the moment. And so as we talk about pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, we look at what the drug does to the body and what the body does to the drug. And we can look at specific pharmacokinetic treatment issues, particularly in what we in the pharmacy world call the ADME, A-D-M-E absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of the medications. And we could look at absorptive issues, such as with rolpivirine. Rolpivirine, a second-generation non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor, but requires an acidic environment for absorption. And so you may run into pharmacokinetic uh, adverse drug reactions, or excuse me, a uh, drug drug interaction with a proton pump inhibitor, or even high doses of H2 block. We can take a look at a different absorptive issue of chelation with di or polyvalent cations with integrase strand inhibitors. And this is why we recommend, and what is recommended generally in the guidelines, if we look at uh, wh whether it's guidelines or drug interaction resources, you know, looking at 
um, supplementation. So if someone's taking a calcium supplement, iron supplement, you know, the HIV population is getting older. And so this way as a whole. And so this way we can make sure that everyone who needs their supplements are taking them appropriately and appropriately spaced from their integrase strand inhibitors if that is a regimen that they are on. We can also take a look at metabolic problems. You know, if the, if the medication, as most of our HIV medications, undergo metabolism through the cytochrome P450 substrate system of the liver, and we know that there are other medications out there, such as your rifampins, your antiepileptics of the world, things that are inductive or speed up the machine, if you will, decreasing levels of other medications that undergo the cytochrome P450 metabolism. So, we can use different resources, and different resources are available um, based on whichever location you're calling from. There may be drug interaction resources available through your electronic medical record system. There may be resources available through a third party, such as, and I'm going to name a couple of them, I'm, I'm not endorsing anyone in particular, your Lexicomps of the world, your Micromedixes, your Hippocrates, things of that nature. But additionally, we also have dedicated HIV drug interaction resources. And I, if you are not using it already, I highly, highly recommend it. This is a drug interaction checker that is free and available to use through the University of Liverpool in England. And it's become so common in the HIV world that we've actually turned this into a verb. Have you Liverpooled the patient? It is available both as a website as well as an app for the phone. I find the website a little bit easier to use than the app, but that's just my personal preference. Available at hiv-druginteractions.org. I have that listed later in the presentation. This information is available in both English as well as Spanish and can also is so easy to use that this can be delegated to some of your non-clinical office staff members to try to at least click off some of the drug interactions or then eventual review by the clinician. So once we've gotten through all of these other pieces and we actually are understanding that there may be some kind of resistance with the patient, and this is the meat of the presentation we're talking about today, we have to take a look, well, how are we assessing resistance? How are we defining resistance? So the first type of resistance test that we can do is by far and away the most common. And please forgive me if this seems remedial, that we wanna make sure that everyone is on the same page here today. And the first is a genotypic assay. Genotypic assay, and I have here listed in the cartoon bottom, on the, toward the bottom of the slide, that we have patient viral RNA. So this is assuming that the patient is viremic at this point in time. It is generally assumed, although this can depend based on the lab that's being used, that the patient needs to have at least a minimum of 500 copies, as I have listed here on the third bullet point, for there to be able to be sufficient information for them to be able to run this test. Certain labs actually require higher barriers. It's, it's been seen with some labs, they need actually a thousand, but it's generally accepted that they need at least 500 copies in order to run a genotype. So what happens? We have circulating virus and patient viral RNA is converted to RNA by reverse transcription, amplified, sequenced, and compared to a wild type. So we are taking the patient's actual circulating virus, and we can follow along here in the cartoon. We go from RNA to DNA and then amplify it. And then what they do is they sequence it and compare to the, the regular standard. So that being said, we have a regular standard, but we have to be able to interpret what do these changes mean. And we'll get into a little bit about what that means on some following slides. These changes can be indicative of a prediction of drug susceptibility because we know that in certain changes, this causes different steric inhibit inhibition or different physical changes in three-dimensional space of the virus, which then causes certain medications to not work as well. So again, what we're seeing here are changes in the patient's actual virus as compared to a natural wild type and predictions of what that then means. It is of note, that genotypes, because we are looking at circulating virus, will only present what is present in 20% or more of the circulating population. So it is entirely possible that there may, may be mutations in minority populations that just aren't showing up in the genotype because they're not sufficient, or they're not a present in sufficient volume. This is why it is so important that genotypes, we always consider additive. So I always recommend to all practitioners, as I do in my own practice, 
make sure in every patient's chart that you have a place where you have a running list of all the medications your patient has ever seen and a list of all the mutations that have ever come up in any genotype. Because again, it's the genotype in front of you is only going to show what's in more than 20% of the current existing population. As patients' medications change in and change out, this may be reflective slightly differently. So we always want to make sure to add all of our genotypes together. Now, a genotype is very, very different than a phenotype. A phenotype is what I call the oh no test. This is when you have a patient who has multiple mutations to multiple classes, and you're trying to create this fairly a salvage regimen. A phenotype is performed by exposing a sample of an individual's HIV to known or available antiretrovirals. And what it does is it measures the ability of the virus to grow in different concentrations of those antiretrovirals. So as you can imagine, this test is not commonly done. It takes a long time because it's labor intensive and is quite expensive to run. So again, just as with the genotype, we need to make sure we have sufficient amount of virus because we have to then take that virus and try to grow that virus in the context of some concentration of specific antiretrovirals. And we can see here, as an example on the bottom of the slide, we can see here drug susceptibility and the full changes if the virus is not replicating or if the virus is replicating in the presence of that medication which is not what we want, as you can imagine. Here we can see a net assessment of resistance or sensitivity, but this is not necessarily predictive as we had in the genotype. Remember, we were just looking at changes before and we were saying, okay, well, this change generally means this. Here we are physically saying this drug has either grown or not grown in the presence of this medication. So to summarize, taking a look at the third bullet point on this slide, this can determine which antiretrovirals will be individually susceptible or resistant, as well as a replication capacity determination. And I want to take a moment and just define that. I, I just had a resident on a rotation with me, and I always like to talk about replication capacity uh, in terms of an old 1950s horror movie called The Blob. And uh, basically, the blob got bigger and bigger as it ate more and more people and started terrorizing its way around, across the city, as you can imagine, old 1950s horror movies. And so, as you can imagine, as HIV acquires more and more and more mutations, this creates, if you will, a clunky virus. It has a lot of mutations to hold on to in order for it to be able to find its way around all of the existing medications. And so, the, the ability of that virus to replicate as quickly against what's known as wild-type virus, wild-type virus meaning a virus that has not seen any medications, is going to be significantly reduced compared to that wild-type virus. So the virus continues to march along, albeit at a slower rate. So we have now reviewed genotypes, which are most commonly done in context of resistance testing, and phenotypic testing, which is generally only done in the context of multi-drug resistant patients. Patients who have very difficult to interpret regimens, or if there are significant mutations in the context of the protease inhibitors, simply because we know that protease inhibitors are already a second or third line medication. And so when there's a lot of resistance happening with protease inhibitors, we have to figure out what else is available. It is of note before we move on that phenotypes at this point in time, what is generally only tested for, because as you can imagine, they're trying to test against all the different medications that are out there. They're really only testing nukes, non-nukes and protease inhibitors. Rarely, if you have the right lab, they will also do integrase inhibitors, but that's not very commonly done. Now, there is a third type of testing that is not generally done in the context of regular clinical practice, but is finding its place. Because before, once again repeating, we talked about genotypes and regular phenotypes, sorry, regular phenotypes and genotypes, in the context of circulating virus. There's virus around, we're going to do some testing. But 
But now we're talking about a patient who is suppressed, a patient who is doing everything right, and they're taking all of their medication, and they have suppressed virus. We cannot run a genotype or a phenotype in a patient who's suppressed, specifically because there's no circulating virus. So I'm going to give you an example. A patient comes to you, they're new to your practice, they've been on medication for the last seven years, and they don't have any of their previous records available. They come to you on a fairly complicated regimen, let's just say three or four pills a day, and they say, Doc, I'm getting tired of taking all of my medications every day. Is there something that we can do to reduce my pill burden? And so you then need to kind of figure out, is there resistance in this patient's history? But you can't do a genotype or phenotype unless you take the patient off of the medication. Enter what is called the proviral DNA, otherwise known as an archive genotype. This again does not have regular use on your run of the mill viremic patient. This is used only in very specific circumstances. So you can see here, as I've listed in the first bullet point, this provides information across classes when standard testing cannot be performed due to insufficient viral load. So you're asking yourself, well, how are we getting this information? What virus are we using in order to be able to determine does this patient have resistance? So let's take a look at the graphic here on the bottom of the slide. And we can see here a blood vessel with a very, very, very small amount of plasma HIV virions, but not in a sufficient quantity such that we would be able to run a regular genotype or phenotype. And this is just assuming that there are plasma HIV-1 virions. There may be less than 20 not detected. You know, this may or may not even be present. But what is present if we are drawing out whole blood, not plasma, but whole blood, is we have some CD4 cells that are along the ride. Because what we know in terms of the regular HIV viral life cycle is that HIV genetic material finds its way into the nucleus and combines with our own genetic material. This means that there are some CD4 cells that have not yet been infected that therefore don't have any HIV viral genetic information. However, there may be some CD4 cells that have HIV genetic material that has already combined with our own. So if we are able to crack open the CD4 cell and able to grab out the genetic material that has been combined with our own, we may be able to sequence that information to be able to give us some genotypic information. Are there any changes that have happened? Now, as you can imagine, this is, some in, this is some powerful information where we were not able to grab it before. But it is important that we take this information with a grain of salt, if you will, because what we are not grabbing is circulating virus. We don't have a representative population of the total population of virus that is happening in a person's body. But rather, we are only representative of the 5 ml of blood depending on whatever CD4 cells just happen to have come along for the ride. So the specificity of a proviral DNA or an archive test is quite low. So what has been shown in regular clinical trial or in clinical trials looking at proviral DNAs or archives comparing them is that nothing replaces a circulating genotype or phenotype. And that's why those are first line. This is some information to be only used in specific circumstances where you were unable to grab all of that other information and you were unable to grab you know, tr proper treatment histories. Like I said at the very beginning, nothing, nothing in any of this presentation replaces a proper question and answer session with your patient. What medications have you been on previously? We actually have a large pill board in my office where people can point out medications that look familiar to them. And being able to say to the patient, did anyone ever change your medication because they said those medications weren't working? They had to change because of, did they ever use the word resistance with you? So as I order a proviral DNA, I always go into it with a specific question in mind. I am specifically ordering this because I want to be able to say, can I or shouldn't I use this one medication in particular? Because as we mentioned, the specificity of this test is lower than with 
regular genotypic testing, simply because you're limited only by the amount of blood that you are drawing from that patient. So we talked about the different types of tests. But now we have to ask, well, when are we ordering the test? And again, this is based off of US guidelines. Please follow the guidelines where you are locally. But this will give you a basic idea of the different, of the different circumstances where you may want to think about this. And is this, you have to ask, is this applicable to your patient population and the, and the patients that you see? We definitely want to order a genotypic test with confirmed virologic failure, particularly if you are using specific guidelines that say, okay, this is first line, this is second line, but then beyond that, you got to figure it out. Or are you, do you practice in a, in, a, uh, in a place where if a patient fails a first line regimen, then you may want to do genotypic testing thereafter. But that being said, we want to make sure that there's sufficient viral load present so that we can order a regular genotype. And it is additionally important to order that genotypic test while the patient is taking the failing regimen. And we do this specifically because the failing regimen is still imbuing selective pressure on the virus. So the virus is specifically expressing those specific mutations. And we want to make sure to sequence those, grab those, denote those, and figure out what to do next. Secondly, we may want to think of ordering a genotypic test if there is a suboptimal viral load reduction. Guidelines tell us that in a viremic patient, once you put that patient on antiretrovirals, you should expect to see a one log drop in that viral load at about four weeks time. If you haven't seen that one log viral drop, drop now many of our patients go to undetectable in a month simply because of the potency of integrase inhibitors, but noting that integrase inhibitors are not available in all circumstances, but we should at least see a one log viral load drop. If you haven't, this may be indicative that there's some kind of resistance happening with our patient. We can additionally ask, is there a utility, and this is recommended by US guidelines, but is not necessarily recommended by World Health Organization guidelines to do resistance testing across the board in all patients at baseline. And then we also have to ask, is there a need for res integrase resistance testing? As even in US guidelines, we specifically say that you shouldn't really be doing integrase resistance testing at baseline unless you see integrase resistance in more than 1% of the population, which we're not necessarily seeing as yet at this point in time. However, many labs, and you may use a lab local to you, that actually just sticks all the genotypes together. And you, know, you don't have to order these as separate protease and, and uh, reverse transcriptase, as well as integrase, sometimes they just come together. So, which testing? And we've alluded to a lot of this already. Genotypic testing is generally preferred and genotypic information is always additive. Phenotypic testing is recommended only in a patient with known or suspected complex drug resistant mutation patterns. And just to summarize what we've talked about before, archive testing may be useful in unique circumstances when other testings may prove insufficient such as with a, with a suppressed patient without records. So now we've talked about a lot of the different types of tests, but now let's talk about what that then means. What is resistance? We've said, you know, we're, we're identifying resistance, but what is the resistance that it is causing? So let's move on to, and I, I'm doing this by class, I'm doing this by mechanism. So as we take a look at the NRTI, or nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor, mechanisms of resistance, we have to take a look at the specific medication that the, that the patient is developing resistance to. And the genetic barrier of resistance is dependent based on the agent that you're using. It's not a, the same across the board. Certain medications have a higher genetic barrier of resistance, and some medications have a lower genetic barrier of resistance. And so we can see here in the cartoon at the bottom of the slide, the uh, Pac-Man, if you will, Pac-Man chomping along at HIV RNA, creating HIV DNA. We see here that Pac-Man with the mutation causes Pac-Man with the tooth. And therefore, the, the uh, red ball that we can see here in this cartoon, the medication, is not able to fit into Pac-Man's mouth. We can take a look at more technical terms of this. You know, this is steric, steric uh, hindrance uh, because we've caused a change in confirmation of the active site. 
So this causes impaired incorporation of the medication into the growing DNA strand. So that being said, we can give some examples here. And then these are not for memorizing, if you will, but these are just some examples. We can take a look at the M184B mutation, the K65R mutation, the Q151M complex. Let's define how we deter how we uh, how we the nomenclature that we're using here. I'm going to emphasize this M184B that I have in bold. And as you can imagine, that all proteins are made up of individual amino acids. So here, reverse transcriptase is our protein at hand. And the amino acids, it's a very long protein made up of lots of amino acids, have sequences. So we number them, one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, et cetera. So as we talk about the M184V, we are talking about the 184th amino acid on the sequence. And furthermore, we have M is what we have started from, which has then changed to V. So putting that together, at position 184, M has changed to V. And now you're asking yourself, what are M and what are V? And if you remember way, way back from your basic biochemistry days, each amino acid has a one letter abbreviation. So putting that all together now, we're layering on top. At position 184, M, which is methionine, has changed to V, which is valine. And what we know, and this is the reason I emphasize this, is that the M184B is the most common mutation in all of HIV. If methionine has changed to valine at position 184, this causes complete resistance to the cytosine analogs, those being entracitabine and lamivudine, 3TC and FTC. They both end in C, therefore they're the cytosine analogs. That's how we know what is active and what is not active by using this determination and using this nomenclature. And as we've mentioned, these mutations change the binding site on the reverse transcriptase. But for reverse transcriptase, point mutations are not the only type of mutation that we can see, because we can also see what's known as a thiamidine analog mutation, otherwise known as a TAM, which the mechanism is, has also been termed primer rescue. What we can see here in the cartoon at the bottom of the slide is that this causes a separate conformational change to the active site, which allows ATP to come in and excise any medication that is in the active site out. So whereas previously, point mutations may cause resistance to one medication, it may cause resistance to two medications, it may cause resistance to multiple medications, but TAMs, or thiamine analog mutations, cause resistance to all medications within the class. There are six of these, the 41, the 67, the 70, the 210, the 215, the 219. You don't need to remember these. But in order for the removal of the nuke to from the, or in order for removal of the nuke from the prematurely terminated DNA strand, you have to have been exposed, as you can imagine, these being thymidine analog mutations, you had to have been exposed to a thymidine analog. So, which are the thymidine analogs? You're asking yourself, this being AZT. So, there's your thymidine analog ending in T, AZT or zidobudine. And the other is an old medication that has since been removed from the US market. I believe it is incredibly rarely available, if at all, in all circumstances. That being a very old uh, nuclear side reverse transcript inhibitor, that being stabudine. D4T, ending in T again, those being our thiamine analogs. So you have to have been exposed to these in order, <coughs> excuse me, for you to have developed a thiamine analog mutation. So let's now move on to non-nuke or non-nucleus adverse transcriptase inhibitor mechanisms of resistance. And we know that the way that non-nukes work is not necessarily in the active site of reverse transcriptase, but rather in an alternative pocket. And so therefore, as you can imagine, if there's something wrong with the binding affinity or the, um, con if there's a conformational change in that alternative pocket, this is going to prevent the non-nukes from working. I have here low barrier to resistance, but this is not entirely correct because while the first generation non-nukes have a low genetic barrier to resistance, this is gonna really change once we go up the generations. We know our first generation non-nukes, such as efavirenz, 
or nivirapine have low genetic barriers of resistance, but this then increases with second generation like atraverine or ropivirine. And finally, if we move up to what is sometimes called a two and a half generation or a third generation non nuke this being deraverine, this has an even higher genetic barrier of resistance than its predecessors. Single point mutations can confer cross resistance among the class, but this is really dependent on which individual mutation you're talking about. So I can take a look here at an example such as the K103N. A K103N happens to be an incredibly common mutation. This is a uh, resistance to the first generation non nukes, and but it doesn't affect the second generation and doesn't affect the two and a half or third generation, that being deraverine. But I can take a look at an E138K, and an E138K is actually the hallmark resistance mutation to ropivirine, but doesn't necessarily affect other generations. So, you know, it, it's really dependent on which one you're talking about. And that's why I always recommend to my students and residents and even to my colleagues, don't you spin your wheels. If you're, if you're not doing a lot of resistance on a day-to-day day -to -day basis, don't spin your wheels on trying to memorize all those, of those individual mutations, but rather understand the mechanisms and how those work because you're going to be using resources that I'm going to talk about in just a few minutes to be able to put all of that information together. As we talk about protease inhibitors, I mentioned that protease inhibitors are generally used in many cases as second or third line medications. Why? Because they have the highest genetic barrier of resistance in any specific class, and they require multiple mutations to substantially lose antiviral activity. And this, as you can imagine, is hearkening back to what I talked about with phenotypes and where phenotypes become a little bit more useful when we're talking about protease inhibitor resistance, because you need multiple mutations to, have to lose efficacy. So to figure out where you are, sometimes it may be easier to use a phenotype in that specific circumstance. That is with the exception of older medications in the class that nobody uses anymore, sequinavir and melfinavir. We organize protease inhibitor mutations in two specific categories. The first one being major or primary mutations, which limit the effectiveness of the medication. So this is resistance in a very classical sense of the word, as you can imagine. You have major mutations, the medication is not going to work as well. But we can also have minor, otherwise known as secondary, otherwise known as accessory mutations, which improve the viral fitness. They make that medication, sorry, they make that virus, despite how clunky it is, replicate at a little bit of a faster rate. And these prime, uh, so these minor or secondary or accessory mutations may precede the emergence of a major mutation. I think of this almost like a ladder and you need to create the base rungs of the ladder in order for you to create the higher steps. So these secondary or minor or accessory mutations may prove to be those base rungs of the ladder so that major mutations can be built on top of them. As we talk about INST mutations, INST mutations is a very uh, similar concept to what we've been talking about before. We're talking about steric inhibition, or we're talking about changes in the active site and impaired incorporation. And we're looking at point mutations, just like we did before with the nukes. And they can confer cross resistance, but this really depends on which, infer which mutation you're talking about. Here I have an example of the Y143R or the N155H. And you can see here that the Y143R exists on the line of Raltegravir. You can see here 143 if you kind of look across the line. And you see here that that is not represented on the Elvitegravir or Dolutegravir line, emphasizing that it's only applicable towards Raltegravir, whereas the 155, the N155H is available for, sorry, it causes resistance to raltegravir and elvitegravir, but not dolutegravir. So it really depends on which one you're talking about and how that affects other medications within the class. This is why, again, it is so important to keep all this information organized in a patient's chart and also make sure that you are denoting these are the mutations in reverse transcriptase, these are the mutations within protease, these are the mutations within integrase. Because as we're numbering everything out, there's going to be a 138 position on reverse transcriptase, and there's also going to be a 138 position on integrase. They're 
are two different enzymes they mean two different things so it's best to keep yourself organized so that you're not crisscrossing your information now as i previously mentioned information from genotypes are always additive we always put this information together because what is present in one mutation or in one genotype will always be present despite if it is uh, despite if it is uh, represented on a following genotype or not so here it is an example from one of the major resources that people all around the world use to help interpret resistance and to put this information together. This comes from Stanford University in California. This is a free resource that is web-based. Uh, all you have to do is go into Google and type in Stanford HIV. It's the first thing that comes up. And you'll see HIV DB program, DB database program. And you can just throw in all of your information in there. So here I have an example of a patient with an M184D mutation. We said that at position 184, when methionine turns into valine, you end up with complete resistance. And you can see here in the report, high level resistance to emtricitabine and lenibidine. But you also see here that it slightly affects a little bit of a back of ear as well. It's not high level resistance, but it slightly affects some other medications as well. Now, as we take a look here on the bottom, of the uh, of this graphic, we can see here that the uh, that the people from Stanford and you do not need to inter I'm going to repeat this. You do not need to interpret uh, the scoring system, which is proprietary that they use, but it gives us a basic idea of like how is it affecting different medication. You do not need to know the numbers. You do not need to memorize the numbers under any stretch. I don't memorize the numbers, but it gives us a basic idea of how is this working and how are they being able to put this information in an additive fashion. We see here that FTC and 3TC, these get a score of 60 from the M184 mutation, the high level resistance. The higher the number, the more resistance you're going to have. A back of here gets 15. There's your low level resistance. You see here the number isn't this high. But we see here something interesting and that for AZT and TDF, we see negative numbers, meaning that the M184V actually increases the susceptibility of both AZT and TDF. This is because, and what is well characterized with the M184V mutation, while this causes resistance to, to lamivudine and emphysitabine, it decreases the viral fitness. It decreases the ability of the virus to replicate as fast as wild type virus. This harkens back to that replication capacity concept that we talked about previously in the presentation. So despite the fact that the M184V mutation knocked out two medications, it also increased the susceptibility to two other medications because of decrease of viral fitness. Now, second example, here I have a K65R mutation also on reverse transcriptase. Here we can see intermediate resistance to emphysitabine, lamivudine, tenofovir, and abacavir. Here we can see, as we take a look at the bottom in the scoring system, 3TC and FTC, this is a score of 30 as opposed to 60, like we saw before. TDF was 50, and that's the highest that we're going to see here. The K65R is generally considered the hallmark tenofovir mutation, and 45 within abacavir. But what's going to blow your mind is that if we take this information, and we have a patient who expresses the M184B and the K65R together, suddenly we see tenofovir intermediate resistance, lamivudine emtricitabine and high level resistance, and a back of high level resistance. And remembering that the M184V actually increased susceptibility to tenofovir, we see here 50 minus 10, which gives us 40, showing that for tenofovir. Having these two mutations together actually gives back a little bit of activity of tenofovir. Because as we remember, HIV is a three-dimensional virus existing in three-dimensional space. So one plus one may equal two. One plus one may equal six. One plus one may equal negative four because we are moving things around in three-dimensional space, which is why all these mutations need to be put together in an additive fashion. Resources such as the Stanford HIV database can do that. So how do we construct a regimen? How and with what? These recommendations come from the US guidelines. However, they are very closely represented within the World Health Organization guidelines as well. 
we have to ask ourselves, management of ART failure beyond the second line. The two cornerstones of treatment-resistant patients are protease inhibitors and integrase inhibitors. Here I have used as the example, susceptible to dolutegravir and a protease inhibitor, but you can substitute, you know, if you don't have dolutegravir, you have bictegravir, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just using these as specific examples. So if the medication or if the patient virus is susceptible to dolutegravir and the protease inhibitor, we would want to use dolutegravir and add two nukes to it. We could also use a boosted PI and add two nukes, or you can use a boosted PI plus an active integrase inhibitor. Again, two medications with very high genetic barriers for resistance. Moving to the top right, if, you are, if the patient's virus is susceptible to the PI only, we can use a boosted PI plus two nukes. And if the boosted PI is not used, we could use two, preferably three, fully active drugs. And just like in that previous example that I gave with the uh, Stanford, how I was mentioning that we were getting back some activity of the tenofovir, but that still wasn't fully active. So that's not what I mean in this specific case. I mean something that the patient has zero resistance to overall. Taking a look at the bottom left, if the patient has susceptibility to dolutegravir only, I can use dolutegravir plus two nukes. And if dolutegravir is not used, two, and again, I'm just using dolutegravir as a surrogate example here, two, preferably three active drugs. And finally, if the patient is susceptible to neither, the really fun cases, if you will, I need to use two, preferably three active drugs. And you're asking yourself, well, what medications am I using if I can't use an integrase inhibitor and I can't use a protease inhibitor? Well, this is specifically uh, the time where we would think about medications that have newer mechanisms of action. So let's go through some of these medications. The role of cytosine analogs, 3TC and FTC. We know that they have a low genetic barrier because of the development of the M184B mutation but they may still play a role in heavily treatment experience regimen development to reduce the viral fitness. But we cannot consider these medications active if the M184B mutation is present or has been present in that patient. The presence of the M184B mutation will delay the appearance of thymidine analog mutations. Taking a look at some other nukes and non-nukes, tenofovir alafenamide, there has been some limited in vitro data that suggests partial activity of TAP in TAM expressing viruses. And it may be considered where treatment options are heavily limited. We know that specifically from a theoretical standpoint that nukes need to be present intracellularly and outcompete uh, native nucleotides in order for them to be fully active. We know that tenofovir alafenamide has significantly greater intracellular concentrations than tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate, which is why we're able to shrink the dose. You're able to go from 300 milligrams to either 10 or 25 milligrams because you're pushing all that drug intracellularly. So tenofovir alafenamide could theoretically, again, theory, theoretically be active in a slightly higher rate than tenofovir if there are other mutations present. A travery a high genetic barrier of resistance with more than one mutation that's required for failure. And there is available what used to be called the Tibotech, which is the original company that made it. Now it's more commonly known as the Atreverine uh, resistance scoring system, summarizes the known mutations. A combined score of three or four denotes significantly decreased efficacy. The Raverine retains activity among patients with common non-nuke mutations, such as the K103, the Y181, or the G198A. This medication, the reason why we call it a two and a half or third generation medication, improves the drug drug interaction profile over a traverine. For protease inhibitors, we take, can take a look at darunavir. It proves, as I previously mentioned, a cornerstone of heavily treatment experience patient regimens, twice daily dosing among viruses expressing a darunavir associated mutation, and there's a higher binding affinity to the active site than earlier agents within the class. It's the reason why. In many practices, you know, most protease inhibitors have kind of fallen by the wayside these days, with the exception of darunavir and many times adazanavir. Darunavir has an even higher binding affinity than does adazanavir. And we can use, as I just mentioned on the twice, uh, on the second, uh, uh, the second bullet point, you can use twice daily dosing, included in including in patients who have specific darunavir-associated mutations. 
Integrase inhibitors, dolutegravir, an additional cornerstone of heavily treatment experience regimens. And just like with darunavir, in case there's resistance, you can bump the dose and get a little bit more activity, if you will. Twice daily dosing among viruses expressing an inc based mutation or in patients who have concurrent cytochrome P450 inducted medication helps get you around some drug drug interactions. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but some recently approved antiretrovirals, more as an FYI, I completely understand that these are generally not available in all practice uh, settings. Ibilizumab. Ibilizumab is an infusion now available as an IV push that is a HIV post-attachment inhibitor that binds to domain two of the CD4 cell in every two-week infusion or IV push. And it is minimal drug-drug interactions because it is degraded by the internalization of bound receptors. The trial of note, if you're interested, it was in the New England Journal of Medicine called TMB301. It was approved by the US FDA in 2018. Fostemzivir an HIV attachment inhibitor that binds to GP120. It basically prevents the locking of GP120 to attach onto the CD4 receptor of the CD4 cell, thereby preventing the open confirmation. It is a 600 milligram ER tablet BID that cannot be crushed nor slit because the active component is light sensitive. So it absolutely needs to be kept as a whole tablet for patients to take. The trial of note also within the New England Journal of Medicine was bright, was approved by the US FDA in 2020. And finally, the medication that's on everyone's lips these days, lenacapavir. Lenacapavir is a capsid inhibitor that has only just begun because we're only starting to see the applicability right now only approved in multidrug resistant patients. Lenacapavir as a capsid inhibitor is quite interesting because it has multiple mechanisms of action. Uh, we know that the capsid is basically a protective shield around the HIV genetic material. So if you prevent that protective shield from disassembling, the HIV genetic material can't get out and therefore can't make more of itself. Additionally, if you've prevented that shield from performing, from forming around the genetic material, the nucleic acid is just left to the elements and then breaks down as well. Additionally, what we've known is that, Lennox, or what is becoming more known, is that the capsid actually helps the genetic material get into the nucleus. So imagine one medication working in more than one way. Very exciting. This is a subcutaneous injection, actually two subcutaneous injections that's given every six months. So some clinician resources. Where can you go for help? Because if you don't see patients with resistance on a regular basis, this may be great information that you see now. And then six months from now, you're gonna say, what did David talk about again? So we can take a look at the IAS USA, the IAS USA, which is the International Antiviral Society USA chapter. And they create what I affectionately call to my students and residents as the resistance Bible. They have a listing of all mutations that are present and known against all medications that exist. There are comments available per the antiretroviral to, to assist in interpretation. <coughs> Excuse me. But of note, while this is helpful for you to be able to identify mutations, this will not be reflective of the additive or mixed effects of mutations. And so in order to put those together, we can use the HIV drug resistance database, which we previously used in our example. This is otherwise known as Stanford. Um, the, uh, this, it proved a comprehensive resource of resistance mutations, and it uses the proprietary algorithm of individual mutation effects, and it predicts those combined effects for comprehensive analysis. And you can put in inputs from multiple genotypes. As you can see here on the right-hand side, I've listed a screenshot, and basically it's drop-down menus. You can just kind of click through all of the patient's mutations that your patient has to be able to put this information together in one place for a singular report. While this may not be available in all settings, through the University of California, San Francisco, they have created the National Clinician Consultation Center, which is also known as the warm line. It's not a hotline because it's not 24 hours a day. It's a warm line. They'll look at it and then get back to you in a certain amount of time. It's a non-urgent external consultation service, and you can submit cases either electronically or by phone. It is of note that this is going to represent US-based practice, 
and it may reflect medications which may not be available locally based on your individual practice setting. So it is important if you do use this resource to communicate what is available and what is not available in your individual setting. So we're winding down here. I'm gonna go through two quick cases, one simple and one significantly more complicated. And again, I'm not asking you to look up or memorize all the individual mutations, but rather think about the thought processes that we go through as we evaluate a patient case. Case one, which is a suppressed patient. A 57-year-old man presents for a follow-up appointment. Let's take a look at his treatment history. Diagnosed in 2004, his risk factor is heterosexual sex. In 2007, he was initiated with AZT3TC with a Favarens. And in 2009, there was a treatment failure due to non-adherence and a genotype is acquired. He was initiated at that time on TDFFEC plus Dabrunavir Brutonavir. He's now presenting in 2022, complaining of pill fatigue. As you can imagine, TDFFEC, one pill, Dabrunavir, one pill, Brutonavir, one pill, three pills. Medical history, he has type 2 diabetes, the dyslipidemia, and hypertension, the holy trinity I call it in my clinic. Uh, relevant labs, CD4 is 614, and he's doing great. His, CD, his HIV RNA is less than 20. Here I have listed his mutations. We see here that there are several new mutations listed and some non-new mutations listed as well. He actually, as I define these, he has two TAM mutations. Again, he was on AZT in the past. There's your thymidine analog, 67 and 70, and he has an M184B as well, and he has a K103N. If I stick these in a Sanford, I see here that there is significant resistance to several of the new mutations. Again, he has two TAMs. I'm not expecting a lot of these medications to be fully active. And non-new, I'm seeing some resistance to the first generation, uh, first generation non-news. So as a potential regimen, what can I do for this patient? This patient is susceptible to dolutegravir and a protease inhibitor, so I can use that portion of the algorithm. I can switch to darunavir ritonavir to darunavir cobisostat, or that's decreasing a pill there. I can switch to from TDFFEC to a dolutegravir, two very high genetic barriers of resistance, uh, but that doesn't decrease the pill burden for this patient unless I did both of these together. Or I could switch TDFFEC to another susceptible agent. I'm gonna go through one final case that is incredibly complex, but again, talking about processes as opposed to individually talking about this specific patient. This is a 67-year-old female, and this is my final thing before we, before we end today's presentation. So feel free to get in those questions. I'm gonna be around for a few moments after the presentation to answer any questions that anyone has. 67-year-old female with multi-drug resistant HIV-1 presents for potential treatment options. This patient was diagnosed in 95, risk factor was IVDU. We see here a very complex treatment history, 95, 96, AZT and 3TC dual nuke regimen before we had heart. 96 to 98, D4T, DDI, and Dinavir, medications that we would not use in today's practice, but we still may have patients in our practice that have been around for quite some time. 98 through 2006 was on a back of her AZT lenivudine plus lopinavir rotonavir plus efavirenz. And this is a real patient who was enrolled in the benchmark trial. 2006 to 2021, TDFFEC, raltegravir, and darunavir rotonavir twice a day. Relevant labs, 400 for CD4, HIV RNA, viremic, 5,200 copies. And here we can see multiple, multiple mutations to multiple classes. This is an oh no patient. What do I do with this patient? And I can stick this into Stanford and I can see here that the patient has high level resistance to multiple medications in the PI class. Multiple mutations and multiple uh, agents are, have been knocked out with both the nukes and the non-nukes. And furthermore, if I take a look at the integrase inhibitors, I additionally see mutations there as well. So I can order a phenotype, and that is what was done with this patient. And we can see here in this incredibly complex patient that we have reduced susceptibility across the board. Again, the ONO patient at its, uh, at its prime. So this brings us to the susceptible to neither portion of the algorithm with no fully active classes for reverse transcriptase, protease inhibitor and integrase inhibitors. So here is where we would look for the utility of new agents and we can look for agents 
within the classes, maybe that have something with an activity that we were able to grab up from the phenotype. So my last slide, some takeaway points. Thank you for joining us today. Genotypic, phenotypic, and proviral resistance archive testing have unique applications across the management of viral resistance. Mechanisms of viral resistance can be used to determine initial efficacy of classes. However, the effects of the mutations may be additive or mixed. Cornerstones of regimens among heavily treatment experienced patients generally include darunavir and or dolutegravir at appropriate doses. Fostemzivir, ibilizumab, and lenacapavir have expanded the arsenal of agents used to suppress, used to suppress MDR HIV-1. And finally, multiple online resources exist for clinician assistants to manage these cases. Thank you so much for joining us today. Once again, thank you to PenCap, to Shanti, to all the staff at PAHO for being able to make this lecture series possible. And at this time, I'll stick around for any questions anyone may have, but feel free to reach out to PenCap for additional resources, including, and I'm not gonna give it away, but some potential resources for clinicians with resistance that may be, uh, with resistant patients that may be under development. Shanti, thank you again. Oh, thank you so very much, Dr. Corin. That, as usual, I think is really, really um, fantastic. Um, quite comprehensive, and I do like the um, approach taking us very quickly from, from adherence all the way through to a really very complex case as you closed your presentation. I'm happy to see that we have quite a lot of HIV practitioners in the room. Um, and so colleagues, I know this has been a tremendous amount of information for us to be able to think through. But if you do have questions, begin to type them using the chat bar on your webinar panel. Um, and as Dr. Corin is saying, we do have a few minutes. I know we're a little bit over time, but we do have a few more minutes that we can um, take any questions. But again, um, Dr. Corin, thank you so very much for really taking us through in a very systematic way, starting from adherence to the nukes and the non-nukes, and bringing us up to more of, of um, um, some of the newer regimen um, talking us through genotyping and phenotyping and the utility of both, um, different approaches, um, archive genotyping, um, pretty, pretty comprehensive. Um, and importantly, thanks for sharing the resources. Uh, a lot of the online tools, those are accessible, they're free, um, and they can be readily used. I think it's, it's really important for us to um, be able to use those as we think through um, how we manage our patients, particularly those patients that we're beginning to see resistance um, patterns as we manage them. I do not see, I'm not seeing any questions at this point in time. I know it has been a lot of information. I've stunned them all. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> really, really very exciting. Um, and it's good to also hear about, you know, we know of the KN013, we know of the M184V, we've been dealing with all of those um, in the region, but really interesting to hear of the newer, um, the newer classes of drugs. Um, I think you touched on the capsid inhibitor and did a really good explanation on how len, len, lenacopovir, the mechanism um, for lenacopovir. So good to also hear of, of those newer, um, newer pharmaceuticals and newer drugs of ARVs. Um, we just have one comment that has come in from someone. Thank you very much for saying that this has been an excellent presentation. So um, colleagues, I know it has been a lot and uh, maybe you do need some time to think through the presentation. We will be sending you the slide set. Um, do take a, another look at, at the slide set, um, at the information that's contained in the slides. And if you do have any questions, you can email them, them to us. Dr. Corin um, is available. Um, he would put together any responses that you have and I can email those to you. Um, so without further ado, let me go ahead and maybe um, close today. Um, so again, thank you all for, for attending. Um, thank you again, Dr. David Corin for putting together an excellent, excellent, excellent presentation. Um, I want to thank PAHO for collaborating with us as usual for bringing these um, webinars to the region and to you, our participants. Uh, so again, thanks again, everyone. Please do join us.
our next webinar, we will be discussing um, histoplasmosis, histoplasmosis and cryptococcus uh, as we think through how we manage advanced HIV and how we diagnose and manage opportunistic infections. Um, Dr. Jeffrey Edwards is our presenter and we will share with you uh, the webinar announcement in the upcoming days. So again, thanks to you, Dr. Corin. Colleagues, uh, you will receive, like I said, the webinar survey. Please do give us our feedback. And to everyone, have a good rest of the day. Thank you all. Thank you all.